my connection to Hollywood, my friendship with Hollywood, although of course I have a certain distance to it and uh, <clears throat> I just always want to make a point, I'm not, not someone who would ever condemn it, would be so stupid. Uh, Hollywood has given us e extraordinary films. I've just recently seen uh, Elia Kazan's film um, Viva Zapata, which is one of the finest films, finest storytelling. You've said you love it because it's movies, movies. It's movies, movies. What yeah, does like that mean? Kung, Kung Fu is movies, movies. Godard is not movies, movies. It's cerebral stuff, and it's much of it is counterfeit money. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> but uh, Kung Fu, Fred Astaire, porno films, that's movies, movies. Those three together? Easily, yes. That's, m movie has a great bandwidth. And, and it, it continues to, to give us uh, new forms, uh, uh, unexplored things. Uh, uh, recently I've been uh, very fascinated by 360 degrees uh, immersive uh, virtual realities. Uh, <clears throat> there's a new form of, and I'm fairly certain it is not an extension of, of 3D cinema. Uh, it is something completely different and new. It's not an extension of video games. It is not uh, anything that we can edit, like we could edit a film, because you see really all around you. And, and when you have this mask on, when something is coming at you and, and you see a car flying by and you bend down and of course you have to step on, a, on, on some sort of a mat that has sensors. It feels and calculates where you are moving and where you are looking. And you look around the corner and all of a sudden there's a bad guy coming there and, and, and waiting. And you have to look around the corner, even that is possible. But are you <clears> it's not cinema. That? Are you excited by that possibility? I don't know yet. I find it's a totally, utterly new instrument and nobody knows how to fill it. Nobody knows. Uh, of course, uh, very simple things, more contemplative things, are all of a sudden interesting. You have a Mongolian yurt. The camera which looks in all directions are, uh, are there around you and all of a sudden somebody laughs next to you and you turn your, fa your head and there's an old man who, who is telling a joke in Mongolian and has just laughed. So it's very, very strange. And uh, I'm asking myself about uh, how can it be filled? What, what are the parameters? What's so new about it? Is that uh, not what happens when anything is new? No, uh, normally you can see very early on you could see what you could do with cinema. And you can tell when you look at the Brothers Lumiere. Uh, 1898 or so they sent people around the world filming uh, the world, uh, a market in Vietnam, uh, Indian yogis, uh, some traveling shots and, and everything that's in cinema possible was basically there with the exception of 3D cinema, but it was all there already from its first moments. Uh, and here, it's very, very odd, and it's, number one, you, uh, you feel uncomfortable, and almost everyone, if you have it longer than five, six minutes, is mask on, uh, on you. Do you, do you mean uncomfortable in the sense of being assaulted? N no, uh, not really. It's something else. You are immersed in a space that is not yours, and you start to feel uncomfortable, and I don't know exactly why and what is the effect. Maybe because things were not contemplative enough. They are trying to give us the 3D action film effects, and they do not work so well. And um, something, comes to my mind, something comes to my mind when you mentioned Lumière. Yes. Uh, when you went back and looked at your very first film, The Lost Western, you saw in it what Lumière had already started no, to no, do. No, no, no. First, the Lost Western is just a, a tiny uh, high school joke with my friend. Uh, when we were 15 or 16, he was tall. He was our tallest 
uh, man in the in class, and he looked like Gary Cooper, and he said, "I'm I'm like Gary Cooper, and I'm better as an actor than Gary." And I said, "Come on, let's pick up the camera and show it to us." So we did that. It has no no consequence. This film, we shouldn't we shouldn't. We should not it. talk about and, it. And of um, course, let's let's yeah. not talk about it. Let's yeah. move right on. Um, I, I'm sorry. But let let me say yeah. one more thing about immersive reality. There's a very interesting case. Uh, my wife is good friend with uh, a, a young woman who lives in New York, and she works in uh, in selecting and arranging photos. And from her office, she has she has a corner office, and she sees two thirds of the skyline of New York, a spectacular vista. That's one uh, one part of the reality of images. Second, she has two screens or three screens for the work she is doing, photos from all over the world. Next reality is two screens in a corner or next to it, and both are live broadcasts, one of an eagle's nest and the other one of, a, of, of some owls. Both of them are hatching young ones, both of them. So during day you see the eagles when she works at night, she sees the owls. And it's heartbreaking because among the, among the owls there's one feisty, uh, bigger one that eats everything and, and finally tosses the weakling, the puny runt, out of the nest. And, uh, uh, and that uh, is all of a sudden a drama that makes her cry. And I understand that. I understand that. And if what I'm trying to say is, if virtual reality becomes completely and utterly contemplative so that 24 hours some reality outside of yourself is going on where all the spectacle uh, doesn't have to be uh, hammered into you, then it may be something really good for, let's say, people who are in hospital or people who are in re uh, rehab or people who are on, even on, on death row. That would be good cinema for them. We will have a moment talking about death row in, in a while, but before we get to that, a little passage from this most extraordinary book that I encourage you, Werner has signed many copies for you, Werner Herzog, A Guide for the Perplexed, Conversations with Paul Cronin. By the way, um, Paul, Paul, is Paul here Cronin in the audience, is here to my complete and we, we should utter congratulate surprise. him. Yes, he has been 10 years into it and has forced me to, to be precise and to go back into memories that were already buried somewhere. So uh, if, if I faint here, he will step in. If, if you faint, he will step in as well. He can do, he can do both. And if we both faint, you'll have a trouble. Um, yes. But, but we'll, we'll try to... We'll try to I want to just congratulate Paul on this most yes. amazing achievement. Um, I, I highly recommend you read this book. In it, he very early on relates this story, which I'd like you to expand a little bit on. One might speak about the imagination you had as a child. When I was five or six, I fell quite ill. There was no point in calling an ambulance because we were too deeply snowed in. So my mother wrapped me in blankets, tied me on a sleigh, and dragged me through the night to Aschau, where I was admitted to hospital. She visited eight days later, coming on foot through deep snow. Yeah, 15 and, kilometers. And was amazed that I, without complaint, I had pulled a single piece of thread from the blanket on the bed and played with it for all that time. I wasn't bored. This strand was full of stories and fantasies for me. Going back into yeah. that memory, what, what, what engaged you in that piece of thread? I think I was very self-contained in a way as a child. Uh, and uh, not easy to deal with me, although I was a very sociable kid, but at the same time irascible and uh, somehow withdrawn. And I would, uh, 
figure out mathematical things, very simple things. Why is seven by three the same like three by seven? So and I, when, before I was in school, I figured that out, and I, and and my um, peers would not understand why I was into this. So there was a, a certain amount of loneliness, although contrary to that, uh, all the refugee children I was bombed out from Munich uh, when I was only two weeks old. My mother fled to the mountains, to the most remote uh, Bavarian mountains. There were other refugee kids and we formed a gang. We were something like uh, 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 14 and there was one girl. We were 15, but one, one girl was there who was really good within this gang. And so we were constantly together and doing wild stuff and after the world, world war, of course, there were weapons and explosives and we did kind of mischief with it. Uh, <coughs> but uh, uh, it, uh, the world, even the tiny things, were always full, full of fantasy, full of stories. I do not recall which stories, but I remember for the first time in my life, uh, I saw an orange. In the hospital, they gave me an orange, and I studied the orange because nobody showed me. They said, eat it, and I, I very carefully licked at the skin, and then I, I understood you had to peel it, and then inside this... Uh, the segments, and I peeled the segments very carefully, and inside the segments you have this tiny little uh, 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 liquid fluid filled tiny parts, and I took them apart, and for me it was armies, and it was friends, and it was, and, and I tiny bit by tiny bit I actually ate it. It took me, it took me five days until I had eaten, <laughs> until I had eaten the orange. And, and it was something like that with a thread. I, I do not physically or directly recall what that thread... But I mean, I, I feel in a way you've, you've expressed what that thread was. Um, uh, a, yes. A kind of a, a de devotion I understood, and attention. Yes, and I understood. Uh, I, 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 understand, I understand what a thread or what a rope is all about. It's, it's, a, it's a very... And it's not just an instrument. It's... It's more than that. It has some secret life in it. It has some purpose in it. And uh, uh, you can develop whole stories around a rope uh, or a thread. So that's, that's something which uh, was always s somehow in me. Um, I, I want you to tell one story that I just adore in, in Paul Cronin's book your arrival in 1964 in Pittsburgh in the Franklin family. I, well, uh, I have to make it very short. I, I came by boat, had a scholarship, and I could have been every, any, I could have chosen pretty much any university. And I said, no, not these fancy Ivy League things. Um, and actually the scholarship was because somehow I, I caught the attention uh, because I, I wrote, a, wrote a fraudulent paper in, 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 in about a historical subject. Um, and I had a scholarship and it was so stupid. I wanted to go to Pittsburgh. Real people, steel f factories, steel workers, welders, because I had worked as a welder the night shift uh, during school. Uh, because I wanted to earn money for my first film. So I arrived in Pittsburgh. After a few days, I returned my scholarship. And it was a lot of money. And my guest family, uh, I had to leave. And I, I lost uh, free passage back. And I, I was homeless for about three weeks, four weeks. And sometimes slept out in the street or on the couch of somebody whom I knew from the few days in in, at the university, and then <clears throat> I had a place outside of Pittsburgh where I could sleep. And I had to walk up from a bus station about two miles up a hill uh, in the rain. It was always raining, and, uh, and I saw a car passing me. The third time the car passes me, it stops, and, uh, and there's a, a lady in there and four children. They were all between 17 and 27. They were already grown up. And she said, hey, can we give you a ride? And within the two miles up to the hill, 
she said to me, uh, I said, I'm German and I, I'm having no real place. She said, hey, Kraut, you know what? You can stay. I have six children. Her husband has died, an alcoholic. Uh, but we have an attic, which was actually as, as tall as, as when I was standing. I, I touched always the main beam. And it was uh, an attic with uh, old furniture in it. And there was a bed. And then I lived there for half a year. And it was the most wonderful acceptance in America. You see, that's uh, among, in, in mid-America, you see, you find this. And that's what, what I love. Uh, in politics, the, the, the highbrow Eastern Coast and, and the highbrow Western Coast call them the flyovers. The flyovers from East to West or West to East. And I, I do not like this term because I have had my my best experiences in America there, and the family was completely crazed. A crazed 94-year-old grandmother, a failed rock singer, Billy, who spoke to a cocker spaniel in, in an invented language, would emerge stark naked at four in the afternoon because he played in a little bar, in a seedy bar out in the countryside. And the twin girls who were 17 just came back by school bus and they had some girlfriends. So Billy would walk down stark naked and strum his guitar and sing and speak to the dog. And then there was a retarded young other boy who had fallen from a car. And it went on and on. And he was the first, first fanatical uh, friend of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he showed me these magazines where Arnold, 17 or 18 year old, was pumping irons. And, and I had my, my best time in America ever there for five, six months. Until when I started to work without having a permit, uh, I was summoned to uh, immigration and I knew uh, they would expel me from the country. That was clear. So I fled across the border to Mexico. I didn't want to to go to, um, back to Germany. But shortly before, I had a very, very bad fracture of, my, of this ankle here. I had jumped out from third floor in, in order to trap the girls who were, who were uh, ambushing, trying to ambush me always with the worst eau de colonie from Woolworth and spray me all over. And, uh, and I would smell like a skunk for, for two days and two nights. So I jumped out the, the window and tried to tackle them from behind with, with uh, um, shaving foam. <laughs> but this whole thing didn't, didn't go well. I, I had a, with this leg, I still cannot they, jump they, until they, today. They introduced you to, to the Rolling Stones, I think. Yes, I introduced the, the twin girls and, and their girlfriends. It was the first time ever. Rolling Stones, uh, and I think the second concert in the United States, Pittsburgh. And I was in the Civic Arena, 11,000 uh, capacity crowd, and all of them screaming teenagers, and mostly girls. And when the thing was over, when this thing was over, I, I was completely stunned what was going on, and they, they all stood up and left. And I was a little behind, and, and all these plastic seats in which you sat, not all, the, all of them, but at least, let's say, one out of four was peed. It was, was containing pee and was still steaming. <laughs> and I walked past that. I walked past that and I said to myself, this is going to be big. <laughs> um, thank you. Um. <laughs> I want to talk about the, the importance that literature has had for you in terms of being, offering you what you have called consolation, which I, yeah. I find um, you, you often talk about literature as offering you solace and consolation. And you... <clears throat> Much for, more than there are other things as well, but let's yes. speak about the and consolation. You, you, you speak about it in terms of the, the Book of Job, but you also speak about it in terms of the, the Punic Wars. You, you 
you take these books on trips, they accompany you. No, when I to, shoot, yeah. normally when I do, when you I know it's going to be a difficult you, shooting, you need I them. take Luther, Luther's original translation, which is uh, earlier than King James Bible and in a very beautiful stylized German, actually the birth of the German, high German language. Punic War, Second Punic War. Second Punic War, yeah. but before we get to this, yeah. the Punic War, um, consolation, literature as offering consolation. It, yes, it does for me. Um, uh, and there's all, all forms of it. Uh, Recently, The Peregrine by J. A. Baker, a book, uh, an English uh, writer about whom we know literally nothing. J. A. Baker published it in 1967, and it's one of the w most wonderful books. Everyone who wants to make films or wants to be an artist should read this. The intensity of observation and the passion in it that uh, becomes completely almost incantatory and, and then moments of prose that you only have, you have to go all the way back to Joseph Conrad, this kind of caliber of prose. In reading this, I, 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 I know this is, uh, this, it's myself as well, or I, at least I have somebody, a brother out there, whom I, whose full name, J.A., I don't even know the, the first names, what they mean, I think by now it's known. I don't even want to know what J.A. stands for. And yet J.A. Baker is like a, like a deep friend to me who, who gives me consolation. Yeah, and, meaning, and music yeah. sometimes has that in it, and, and of course religion, but I'm not religious. The, the, the amount of consolation you can have when, when you are really religious. What, and what, I have my problems with religious people. I know, people, yeah. I know. But what, um, what does consolation quite mean? Uh, when you are exposed in, in, the, in this uh, universe where we uh, only partially really belong, we are strange guests here uh, that do not really fit there and uh, there's some, some sort of a permanent self-destruction going on and and the self-destruction, or the archetypical, the arch sin, started in Neolithic times, um, when we gave up uh, a nomadic existence. Of course, until today, you have some very, very few pockets of, uh, uh, of nomadic existence. And Bruce Chatwin, by the way, speaks about it very, very, very clearly. So you should listen more to Bruce Chatwin than to me. With him, I had this nexus that we were both traveling on foot, uh, also something uh, reminiscent of, of a nomadic existence. Uh, but um, uh, there is there's something uh, self-destructing since then. Uh, cities, science, uh, uh, evolution into a, into a highly technical society, that has the seed of self-destruction in it. We are too many and we consume too much. And uh, it's not, it doesn't look good uh, what's, going, what's going on. So uh, at the same time, we cannot be nostalgic and say, ah, yeah, let's all go back and become nomads again. We won't. This is what it is and, and it's, a, it's a very precarious existence. And we are in a very precarious situation and I hear it all the time, ah, yeah, technology will evolve and we'll colonize uh, the planets. No, we won't, because uh, the biggest planets are only gaseous and the sun is, is unfriendly. It's 100,000 uh, atomic explosions going on every second there. It's not friendly. We shouldn't be on, we shouldn't be on the moon. We have, you, you just, uh, you see, we need air to breathe. And it's not, it's a breath of hundreds of millions and millions of human beings who have exhaled and trees that have exhaled and volcanoes that have shaped our atmosphere. It's the entire history of breath that we don't have out there. It is hundred times more feasible to live at the bottom of the oceans 
or in Antarctica or colonize uh, Greenland with millions of people much easier than maintaining 25 people on Mars. It just will not work. It's not going to work, period. And we will not, we will not reach our next uh, uh, star outside of our solar system because it's four and a half uh, light years away, which means with the fastest, uh, fastest acceleration that a human body can take, it's uh, 110 years until you reach it because you have to accelerate and decelerate. We just won't do it period. And, so and there will be 500 generations of freaks, of, of mad people who have forgotten why they are on, on this trip. And there will, be, <laughs> there will be palace revolts and there will be, there, there will be unspeakable, unspeakable urchins reaching Alpha Centauri. <laughs> unspeakable. We don't belong there. We belong here. And it doesn't look that good. It doesn't look that good belonging here. Uh, well, it's a problem. Yes, but, but we can make the very best out of it. And it's wonderful to be here and, and to be alive and to, uh, to plant an apple tree or make a movie. Martin Luther was asked, uh, what would you do if the world came to an end tomorrow? He would say, today I would plant an apple tree. That was a good one. So, and you had, a, you had a response to that? Well, I would make a, start a movie. Of course, it would remain unfinished, but so what? But you work fast. I work, yes, I do work fast, but not in a day. Uh, I can, if you force me, I could write a screenplay in a day or two, but not uh, filming a film and editing it. I edit fast. The, co the consolation, though, is as I understand it, in part, is an awareness and acknowledgement that you're not alone. That's part, part of it, but it's not the only thing. <clears throat> it, is, uh, it is some sort of guiding, guiding light for me, Second Punic War, uh, heroic figures that come out of nowhere, uh, from North Africa, from Carthage, uh, comes Hannibal, heavily contested at home. There was a very strong party uh, who didn't want him to, to do the attack on Rome via Spain and uh, what today is France and crossing the Alps with elephants. And they knew he would probably, he would probably bring up, uh, the ruin upon, upon Carthage. So that there was heavily contested and, and a man of a boldness and leadership that uh, we have not seen very often in the history of the human race. At the same time, a, a man of incredible designs and incredible initial successes, bringing Rome to the brink of extinction. Uh, the battles of Cannae and uh, uh, Lake Trasumene. Uh, and, and now in, in the complete moment of, of, of utter brink of, of extinction, Rome votes in, into office Fabius Maximus, who is the greatest of all heroes, derided, and by the way, derided until today and unknown until today as, as a great savior of Rome um, and probably of the entire Occident, because we would be much more Phoenician and North African as, as what we are now. You, you, you love Hannibal's single line, I know the destiny of Carthage. Uh, the fate. Yeah, the yes. fate. When, when, uh, and, and that was actually brought upon by Fabius Maximus, who avoided for two and a half or one and a half years open field battle. He knew they would lose and that would be the end of Rome. And he fought a war of attrition, receding, receding, receding. Uh, attacking a small foraging party of, of Hannibal and on and on and his own countrymen, his own fellow citizen derided him as a coward, the hesitant coward, cunctator uh, in Latin. It, it means the, the hesitant, but the more the, the cowardly hesitant who when the army comes, retreats, retreats, retreats and, and, and he brings Hannibal's army 
to, to uh, a point where they are exhausted and have no more uh, provisions. And Hasdrubal, the brother of Hannibal, uh, his fleet is destroyed near Sicily. When Hannibal hears it, um, a messenger comes and tells Hannibal the fleet with all the supplies is destroyed. Hannibal just holds silent for a moment and then he says, mutters to himself, I know the fate of Carthage. Uh, and, and he really knew it was the end of Carthage. I mean, it came later. Uh, year, a few years later, but, but it, was, it was clear that was the end. And the, uh, a consolation in, in uh, making a film in the kind of obstacles, in the kind of uh, daily uh, humiliations you have to go through every single day is full of banalities, full of humiliations. You, you, you Until today, well, you, you, every you, single day. You say uh, about you the Second Punic War, you say when the boat was slipping back in the mud during the shooting of Fitzcarraldo, Fabius Maximus had a hand on my shoulder. Uh, yes, it was well said. It was exactly well, it's how what I, you said. Yes, uh, I think it was well said because that's exactly how I felt. And so you, you were not hang, alone. I mean, he yes, in some and way. you hang in. You hang in, and you know, you know this overwhelming weight and momentum of the enemy can be somehow overcome. The hand, sometimes, yes, the hand was on my shoulder. And I. It, and in that way, it's an. I really, it, you, it's it's not it's not a metaphor. No, I know it's, it's quite not literal. a metaphor. It's literally yes. And uh, so that about consolation, when, when I, I like to read Psalms, so I read, of course, uh, the book of Job, that's, that's real consolation for me. You know, um, I had occasion, well, you, you yeah. know well, um, of, of interviewing Mike Tyson, who said, the past is just us in funny clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Tyson, I, I, I like him a lot, and that's, I advised uh, Paul to have him on his uh, program at the New York Public Library. And, and I also asked Paul now, please take it seriously. I, I said to Paul, uh, don't speak just about boxing and about jail and about all these sort of things. Speak with him about the Roman Republic and speak with him about uh, Pippin the Short. Early Frankish, Frankish, kings. Frankish kings, Clovis and Pippin the Short. And you asked in the, an audience... Maybe no, you I, told me, you ask the audience in this very I, sophisticated... I remember, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it wasn't just I asking. You said, you turn to your audience at the New York Public Library and ask them, who knows about Pippin the Short? Clovis, you might, Charlemagne, you probably would. And of course, yeah. nobody knew. And that's when... Uh, Tyson started to speak about Clovis and Charlemagne and especially yeah. about Pepin and how yeah. incredible... Uh, Schil Schilderich and Schildebert and, and Fredegunde, the murderers. And, know, but the, he, I mean, he, and he got yeah. so involved in saying the Frankish kings and he got so excited and I said, but why do you love the Frankish kings? And he says, they really knew how to kill. And I mean, you know, <laughs> and yeah. he get, got very... Um, yeah. and, and I remember very clearly also that he, he got so excited when we showed him a first edition of Machiavelli's The Prince in the yeah. rare book room at the library. And he looked at the chief curator and he said, I think there's an earlier edition. And he was absolutely right. Yes. And yeah. when I, when I and said to him on he, stage, yeah. you seem so immersed. I didn't use the word yeah. consolation there, but there's something similar. You seem so immersed in all this literature. He said, a home without books is like a body without a soul. Yeah. And I was stunned, of course. And then two or three days later, a journalist called me up and said, do you know that, Mike, that that line isn't Tyson's? It comes from Cicero. And the journalist was saying that to me to say, look, the fraud. And I said, but it's Mike Tyson quoting Cicero. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. <clears throat> yes, and, and, and you, you, what, what, is so, what is so wonderful about it is 
uh, when you look uh, at where does Tyson come from, I think he was a semi-illiterate and uh, his mother a prostitute and they live in one single room <coughs> and her clients are in that room with him and while they were at it he would, he would uh, uh, go pocket. through the pockets of the men through, through the trousers that were over the chair and, and before, he was, uh, before he was 11 I think he was 40 times arrested already and on and on and on. And now this man has this fervent hunger for literature, for history, for, I, I find it absolutely, uh, uh, not, not only astonishing, it moves me very deeply. That's, that's uh, something we, we should never overlook and we, sh we cannot dismiss him as just a violent man. Yes, he's, he has been dangerous and he has been violent, but uh, He's, he's one of these wonderful, wonderful men that I, uh, that I really like and I'm glad that I ever met him. I and remember you did your best conversation uh, probably, with Probably, um, well, I've had a few others that I've loved very much, but I would say that among all the conversations mm -hmm. I had, he certainly was one of the most extraordinary conversations. Two, maybe two months before my mother died, um, she would always ask me, who, Paulie, who are you interviewing next? And I said, Mike Tyson. And she said, who might he be? And I said, well, he was the heavy world champion of the world in boxing. And my mother said, my son is interviewing. And then she sort of caught herself and she said, but how interesting. And she used to always say, when I interviewed all these very fancy writers, she would say, tell them that they have a, that she, they have a fan in Brussels. In this case, she couldn't say that, but she said, you know, you should ask him something. Ask him what it feels like to be hit so strongly on the head. What does it feel like? And I asked Tyson, yeah. and he immediately, I didn't tell him it was from my mother, he immediately responded. He said, what I did for a living is what you've tried to avoid your whole life. And it was uh -huh. just such a candid, immediate yeah. answer. Yeah. And, yeah. and as you would say, end of story. Um, in, in Paul Cronin's book, the, you answer one of his questions about the various characters in, in your, your film, and you say, if one were to watch all of my movies in one go, you would recognize immediately walking down the street someone, uh, a character in my film, you would know that he's part of the clan. And I'm... Mm -hmm. What, what is that clan made of? The, the humiliated and the insulted, to use Dostoevsky's line. The, the, those who have suffered in one form or another. Those who have overcome certain obstacles. I mean, what is that clan of the, the Herzog clan of, of those we would recognize? Well, that's a very complex thing. Uh, as complex as families are. Families are very strange creatures. Uh, and, and yet you, you do recognize, ah, yeah, this is one from the Holdengräber family. When I see your children, I know, yes, wow, Holdengräber. Good luck, is what yes, you say. Yes, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, it's very complex and I, I, can't, uh, I can't simplify it even. I wish I could and could give a short formula, but... Uh, there's a kinship and, and you know they belong together somehow and uh, for, for the oddest reasons somehow the great ecstasy of the sculpture Steiner the ski jumper who flies and defies gravity and death is a, is a close relative of Fitzcarraldo who defies the laws of nature the laws of gravity and moves a ship over the mountain and of course solitude and many things and uh, Fini Straubinger yes is uh, a, in Land a, of Silence yeah. and Darkness but, but it's not only these few films I think uh, when, when you look uh, and, and I, I would dissuade everyone uh, to, to try to look at all my films in one go that would uh, probably uh, drive you into a well, you, you have to go onto a cruise ship afterwards, I guess, <laughs> or something <laughs> to recover. Um, no, it's, it's complicated and I, I, do not, I do not fully understand, but I know, I know right away they belong together. Well, you don't understand in the same way that 
you don't quite understand what that Hölderlin line is or what those poems are. They, yeah. they sort of... You it, don't need to explain everything. Yeah. And you don't need to know yourself completely in order to explain your figures. Only the shallow know themselves. So uh, I should be careful about that. Um, what can I say? Uh, I think you have. And, and these figures, <laughs> all, all these figures have at one point in my life or the other come with great vehemence at me. And, They've and come that quality, at you. Yes, yes, sure. And uh, so I, I deal with them and I transform them and I, uh, I can articulate them and I can embed them in stories and I start to invent around them and I embed them in music and images and, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, ultimately show business. You see, when you are asking so serious questions about solitude and all this, ultimately, I'm show business. Are you telling me to lighten up? Pardon? To, <laughs> to lighten up? No, no, no. It's, it's just I, I'm trying to, to say I, I don't want to lose myself now in, in some depth from which we will not rise again before the end of this evening. Um. There's, there's quite some humor on, on death row as well. So I, I, I like to... To, to bring something out in them, some, some sort of humanity. Of course, I, I do not sympathize with him, and I tell everyone, yeah. At the um, beginning of every film. It, yes, it, it, well, that I, of course, I'm not an advocate of, of capital punishment, they know. But to one young man, Perry, who was actually in, in the film Into the Abyss, <coughs> within two minutes in, into the film, I tell him, uh, I, I sympathize with some of your arguments of your last appeal. He was uh, scheduled for execution eight days, late, eight days later. And I said, uh, but this does not necessarily mean that I have to like you. And nobody has spoken to him like this. And of course, the film could have been over right then and there. But uh, I have a way to, to talk to them. And uh, you see, it's... it's um, completely separated and divorced from journalism. And I think this is a massive mistake of much of what we see in terms of documentaries. They have not divorced themselves from, from journalism. And um, I, I do that, and, and I have no questionnaire. I don't have a catalog of questions. I come in and I have no idea what's going to happen. And I have to, I have to be ready for anything. And I do it, uh, I do it with uh, probably now uh, much better than uh, many years ago because I, I have more experience in life and I, I, can, uh, I, I can better, I can respond, I'm quicker in, in, in figuring out. And after many years of doing hard work or so, I know the heart of men. And that's a key to it. Well, in beginning of uh, Into the Abyss, there's a, um, the chaplain of death row, he rushes on, on the set and he says, I have only 25 minutes and I have to be in the death house. I thought I had an hour with him. So, and he starts in front of the camera talking like a, like a TV preacher, completely and utterly phony, and how beautiful God's creation is and how he uh, goes in the morning uh, in his golf cart and nobody there and he sees a squirrel and then a horse with big eyes looking at him and deer and I stop him and I ask him something that no one else would ask. Tell me about an encounter with a squirrel and he comes apart. He unravels. And it's really, it's worthwhile to see the film just for that moment. It's the very beginning of it. And how do I do it? I don't know. I have it in me somehow. And, and that's, that's why, why I'm doing these films. I only had to stop. Um, I did quite a few, four films first, and then The Longer Into the Abyss, then <clears throat> the uh, production. Uh, um, uh, what is it? Um, Eric Nelson, I think he's even here. Um, I think, well, we'll see. 
afterwards. Uh, I think he's here in town and he's here with us. Uh, and then, since I was successful on television, he, uh, I was asked, yeah, can you do some more? And I did it, and, and that was then too much. You, can, you have to be economical with what you can absorb. Uh, stories of such horror and such uh, incredible... Uh, you're, you're like, like in a maelstrom, like, like and, run and, over and, by and, trucks. And confined in that space because... Yes, yeah, there's sure. A, yeah. There's that yeah. mirror and that separates you from... Right, yes. And Creative Differences, Eric Nelson's company, uh, understood, yes, I have to, I have to stop here. And, and we actually stopped there. And, and uh, we always had collaborated in a very fine way, and, and there has to be some sort of a basic but understanding like this. In, in like some this. sense, Werner, the, they, this man we just saw is part of the clan. Uh, um, I didn't think about that, yes, but he is in a way. Okay, since it's you didn't think about it, tell yeah. me, because I... There's this, an exuberance this, in him, of course. Uh, and I'm an appetite, I mean, yeah. in... in uh, the, the, the kind of... of uh, hunger for life and, of course, hunger for every single detail that we take for granted, that we can have an apple juice when we go down uh, to, to uh, the, the bar and we can have a cappuccino or whatever, and they don't, and they are restricted, and they're living in a, in a cell that is as narrow as that, 23 hours a day and only one hour in, uh, so to speak, outside, but it, of course it's outside, but like a, like a dog's cage. Like, like a small cage, like from here to this ramp here, and about this wide, and, and something I mean, like I remember, seven feet I remember tall. in one of the movies, uh, you, you mentioned that one of the inmates had not felt rain. In, yes, in, for, in for 12 or 18 years. He has not, has not had the experience of rain on his skin for, I don't know, 16 or 18 years. And, and we, uh, we forget easily, quickly, what, what a privilege it is that we can walk out the door and we, we experience rain. And this opening and closing of doors, it was for Dieter so, Dengler. Um, yeah. um, this, this takes me immediately to another transformation of a character, another person who I think is um, part of the Herzogian clan, as it were. Yeah. Perhaps one of my, I mean, I, I, um, I suffer from having many of, of favorite movies of yours, but this one in particular, which is a late discovery for me, only in the last two, three years did I see it. Everybody here, you must see little Dieter needs to fly. I have towards Dieter Dengler a feeling that is not so different from the feeling I have seeing Bruno S. Yes, uh, and uh, of course, uh, very similar to in, in some parts to to my own childhood experiences. Uh, <clears throat> uh, both of us grew up with a pre without the presence of a father. Both of us were very hungry as children. That's a very significant experience. I mean, <clears throat> uh, my brothers and I were just hungry uh, for about two years and so, and I remember it very vividly, but Dieter Dengler, he and his mother and his brother were so hungry that they went to bombed out houses and ripped down the wallpaper and cooked it. The mother would cook the wallpaper because there were nutrients in the glue. The glue. So I was not that far down and, and this kind of dream about uh, what he would do and uh, uh, but it's many, extraordinary, many things. It's extraordinary and self reliance, that the, yeah. Still speaking about dreams, it's extraordinary that the dream came from such a shattering experience. Yes, it's, uh, it's unexpected or, or defies our uh, vanilla ice cream uh, sort of uh, idea about how children form fascinations. Or, or for example, uh, uh, I think we, we, uh, uh, we grow up in, in a way that uh, we very often stylize and beautify and beatify. Uh, and, and sometimes it's very harsh and, and we are brought to, uh, to important steps in our life by very often by banalities or by very harsh things that, that become milder and milder and milder after many years. 
and it's benign and memory has something benign about it and it shapes itself. I think memories are shaping itself in a way within us. There's something almost independent of us. They have a very strange nature and memories of, of some childhood uh, experiences uh, that came to me when I was, let's say, 25. The way I remembered at 25 is completely different from how I remembered it at 65. There are stylizations in it. There are, there are transformations in it. Uh, and uh, uh, we do not have really memory of pain. It dis disappears. And this is why, uh, for example, and I think it's a natural good thing because otherwise women who give birth which is, a, which is a very drastic, extremely painful act. It's, it's, it's really awful and painful, and they forget the pain. That, they, they remember other things of giving birth, never, hardly ever the pain. My mother remembered nothing about my birth, but just seeing me and, and thinking, man, is he ugly. So, because I, 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 I was born with yellow jaundice. Yes, I was ugly, sure. And that's what my mother remembered. And it's beautiful that she remembered that one. You, you shaped Kinski's hysteria. No, 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 he had it. <laughs> And, and you couldn't shape it, you only could give it a frame and make it productive. That I, I, I didn't invent it and I didn't really shape it. Well, it's, it's quite something what he... He, he, was, he was on his own. What he, what he, he, writes, was, about, what he yeah. writes about you that I've quoted once before here, he should be thrown alive to crocodiles, he said about yes. you. An anaconda should strangle him slowly. A poisonous spider should sting him and paralyze his lungs. The most venomous serpent should bite him and make his brain explode, all exclamation points at the yeah. end. No panta exclamation yeah, marks, point, yeah. no, no panta claws, uh, panta claws should rip open his throat. That would be much too good for him. No, the huge red ants should piss, his, piss into his lying eyes and gobble up his balls and his guts. He should catch the plague, syphilis, malaria, yellow fever, leprosy. It's no, not use. The more I wish him the most gruesome death, the more he haunts me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It, it is actually fine prose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I never had a problem with it. Sometimes I helped him to find uh, metaphors and, and, and the vilest expletives from the Oxford Dictionary. You helped him write the, some the, of, it, some some of, the of it. Sometimes of you. when he when he went into these uh, rages and needed some more some more ideas, what what would be uh, what would be particularly insulting and sound good. Of course, he wrote it and he does these things, and he's always said to me, "Werner, well, I have to do this <coughs> because the vermin out there." And he meant the readers. The vermin out there needs that kind of stuff. Otherwise, they don't buy the book. And he was right, yes, I wouldn't have bought it. He had his yell out. And uh, it was fine. Sometimes it was good to uh, have him in the scene that I was preparing quite mellow and quiet and calm and exhausted. Uh, so sometimes I provoked things to make him scream uh, at the top of his lungs. And sometimes he screamed for a long time. But, but, um, of course, there's acoustic energy, which is quite some, some energy, uh, and, and you waste yourself. He didn't frighten you? No, never, but uh, he frightened... Well, I thought, because all the natives around there, the Ashininka Kampas and some Machikengas, they, after a while of screaming, they would huddle together. And they whispered, and then they fell silent, and, and you could tell they were very, very, very uncomfortable. And, and I knew, yes, among them, um, there's 
when there are conflicts, it's done in whispers. They sort it out very, very quietly. And they have a politeness and a tenderness when, when they shake your hand and I stylized it in the film. They just touch you like this. Just. And, and so, uh, and I, I had the feeling, yeah, they, they are scared of Kinski. But then one of the uh, chiefs took me aside and he said, yeah, you, you have seen, uh, we, are, we are kind of afraid, uh, but don't you believe of this screaming madman? And I said, yeah, what, what is it then? And he said, we are afraid of you because you are so silent. <laughs> so, and I think there was a truth in it. And you, you had to deal with it. When you make films, you have to deal with this. If you can't deal with it, don't do, do the job. Else. Yeah, do, do a different job. You have to deal with it. And, uh, and some, some of this footage is a, is a good lesson. And of course, uh, and I always try to, to uh, give some sort of shape to, to this crazy, hysterical energy. And of course, I tried to always make it productive for the screen. And when, you, when you, and when you say you try to articulate, you, you mean, in, in a sense, offering some form of guidance? Uh, not offering, sometimes enforcing it, or tricking him into guidance, uh, defrauding him, telling him God knows what, and, uh, and uh, he would buy it. Very often he had street wisdom, sometimes he wouldn't buy it, and be even more violent in his rage. But you have to, you see, I, I, that's what I like about uh, Jesse Ventura. Jesse Ventura was a former studio wrestler, uh, and he was also for a very short time bodyguard of the Rolling Stones, and he became governor of Minnesota. Very, very um, eloquent man. And, um, and I have one wonderful dictum from, from him. He says, uh, win, if you can, lose if you must, but always cheat. <laughs> <laughs> and he had some, also some very, very beautiful uh, saying about, it's actually in the Minnesota Declaration, my manifesto about fact and truth in, uh, in cinema. And uh, he, when he was uh, governor of Minnesota, uh, had immediately the media and everyone at his uh, uh, converging on him, he should pass legislation against snowmobile drivers who would, when spring came, still drive out on the thinning ice on the lakes. And many fatalities happened because the bozos would, would uh, drive out on the thin ice and break through it and drown. Many of them drunk. And uh, Jesse Ventura's uh, answer was, you can't legislate stupidity. You, and uh, Vanna, you, you, you have said that you, you think that in the future people will perhaps remember your writing even more than your films, that you believe that your writing in some way is better. Um, yeah, I will outlast, and I think I wrote something about stupidity. As, you did, which I want as, to, yeah. I, it's, it's a nice segue. I want you to, to read yeah, this little passage. I had passage. forgotten completely about it, but uh, it's when I walked around Germany. In I 1982. Wrote, whatever, yeah, I, I walked along the border. I mean, literally the borderline uh, in all its uh, sinuations, because um, I wanted to hold the country together. Willy Brandt in a, a statement at the Bundestag, a government statement, said the, um, the book of the German reunification is closed. And the German chancellor cannot say that. And I said, it's only the poets who can hold the country together. I walk around my own country and hold it together. I, I didn't walk all around it. I fell ill and had to go to hospital. But while I was walking, I wrote uh, I haven't seen it since I wrote it. When it is all up with Germany, when human beings cease to exist, and ants and cockroaches have taken over, and subsequently algae in the oceans that have started boiling, 
when the earth when the earth is then extinguished and the universe goes dark collapsing in on itself to nothing it is possible that something abstract will remain behind perhaps something akin to a state of happiness but i have a deep fear inside me but i have a deep fear inside me that what will fill the darkness and the space that no longer exists will be a form of stupidity <laughs> it does not need to be a part it does not need a particular place it is everywhere happiness at least requires open space not okay bad. thank you not good bad. night good evening Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.